So you mentioned meditation. I'm sure I'm going to miss something. Contemplation, circling. I don't know what that means. Yeah, paraphrasing. I believe. Yeah, lexio divina. Am I getting that right? Well, actually, the the practice is a variation on it called philosophical fellowship. Okay, perfect. So, could you walk us through these and just give an example of an exercise, what that might look like in each of those? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, first of all, the distinction between meditation and contemplation. You know, I've been talking throughout about how you frame situations, what you make salient, what you background and what you ignore. So think about that like the lens and the frame of my glasses, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not aware of my lenses or my frame because I'm aware through them, beyond them, and by means of them. So they're transparent to me. Now, sometimes, and what I'm doing right now, everyone, I'm taking my glasses off because there might be something on my lenses, and now they're not transparent to me. I'm not looking through them. I'm looking at them. That's what meditation mm -hmm. is. It's about trying yeah. to become aware, step back and look at your mental framing. So what you do is, for example, you try to get people to look at something they're normally looking through, like their sensations. So mm -hmm. for example, I teach people how to center, but like they're following their breath. And you want to follow the whole of your breath going in, and you want to feel the sensations of the breath and of the expansion of your abdomen and the sensations of your abdomen contracting and the breath coming out. And what happens is, right, you're paying attention to the sensations, and very quickly your mind goes to, no, I want to I look through things. I want to look at the world. I should be doing my laundry. Or when is the meditation going to be done? Or I wonder if Susan still likes me. And then what you do is you step back and look at that distraction. You don't look at what you're thinking about. You label the process, thinking, imagining, hoping, wondering. And then you return your attention to your breath. And so what you're doing is you're learning to step back and look at your framing. Now, think about this, even in the analogy, if I, just, if I just take my glasses off and look at them, and maybe I wipe them, and I wipe them, and I wipe them, and I wipe them, how do I know if I've actually cleaned them? What do I need to do? Got to put them back on. You got to put them back on and see if you now see more clearly and deeply than you used to before. That is contemplation. It comes from the Latin word contemplatio, which is a translation of the Greek word theoria, which is where we get our word theory from, which means to look deeply into reality. So vipassana is this act of I'm stepping back and looking at, but meta is a contemplative. I'm trying to look, I'm trying to see if how can I see you better than I used to? So in meta, I'm trying to open up and see if I can see you better. Or I may contemplate the impermanence of existence. I'm trying to see, I'm trying to. I'm not just thinking or saying, I'm trying to realize the impermanence of things. That's mm -hmm. a contemplative act. It's a direction mm -hmm. outward. And for folks who aren't familiar with meta, is it fair to describe that as loving kindness meditation? Well, it depends what you mean. And this is where the <laughs> controversy. So if you think of loving kindness as a particular good emotional state you're going to get into, I would argue you're confusing a method with a goal. Okay. So... Positive emotions, this is Fredrickson and other work, they open you up. They make, they make you curious. They, they afford wondering. They allow you to question things. They, they put you into an explore mode. But it's mm -hmm. the exploration that's important. What I'm actually trying to do in meta is I'm trying to open myself up so that this overlaps with stoicism too, right? So, so the Stoics have this idea that whenever we're going into situations, we're automatically assuming identities and assigning identities. I'm the professor, you're the student, or I'm the, the, the scientist and you're the famous podcaster or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Right? And we're, and we're doing that, and, you know, I'm this and this is a tool, a water bottle. But of course, it's not, it's not that in and of itself, right? And so what, what that co-identification process is happening mostly mindlessly, automatically, and reactively. And the, the Stoics were trying to get us aware of this, right? Mm -hmm. And in, in meta, what you're trying to do is get aware of what identity am I assigning to you? What identity am I assuming? And how is, how is that locking down the situation? And how can I open it up in an exploratory way so that more of your suchness, what you are beyond my assigned categories and identities can start to shape how I see you and who I am and can be starts to be shaped 
by resonating with that. And now I'm trying to see more deeply into you. The Buddha warns against positive emotions just as much as he warns against negative emotions. Like the idea, I don't like the North American interpretation of meta as I want to really feel, feel really good about people. I think that confuses it with Christian notions of forgiveness and other things. What it is, is can I come to a place where your identity and my identity can be born afresh right here and right now, and what that can do for transforming both you and I as a real mm. possibility. Mm. Okay, thank you for that clarification. And it, it makes sense that, I mean, there would be some conflating with what you mentioned with the, especially with the labeling of loving kindness by a lot of people in the United States, just given the, given the history. Can I riff on that just one second? Because sure. that goes towards a fundamental understanding of misunderstanding of love. Love mm -hmm. is not a feeling. Okay, first of all, right, but love is not even an emotion. When I love somebody, that can make me angry, jealous, sad, happy, joyous. Love is an existential binding. It's an existential stance. It's a commitment to this co-identification process and it being something by which each of us can bring out the good and, and cultivate deeper personhood for each one each other. Love isn't an emotion. It isn't a feeling. So thinking that loving kindness is cultivating a particular emotion is not only mistaking the Buddhist idea, it's just misunderstanding what love is. Love isn't yeah. an emotion. It isn't a feeling. It's an existential stance of commitment to binding your identity to the identity of something or someone else. So meditation, contemplation, I'm not sure what you came next, paraphrasing. Circling. Circling. What would be an example of circling? So that's where you've got to, you've got to talk to Guy Senstock at some point. I mean, the, the, mm -hmm. circling is this practice, and the best way I could describe it, and it takes, there's a lot of exercises and skills you have to build to do the practice well. So I don't want people to misunderstand. I'm not, like, I'm, I'm just talking for, for simplicity, right? I'm not mm -hmm. giving you the full secret sauce or something like that. The best way to describe it is how can you and I get into, you know what stereoscopic vision is? You know, the left and yes. right visual fields and they, they mm -hmm. integrate so you get depth. So I want stereoscopic mindfulness. And what does that mean? I want mindfulness into me and mindfulness into you. And in a way that's affording you to get mindfulness into you and mindfulness into me. And then we resonate on that. It's a way of being like, I noticed that you leaned forward and did this. What's happening in you right now as you're doing that? And then yeah. you tell me, and then you tell me what you're noticing in me. And you get this kind of, you know, accelerating, mutually disclosing mindfulness enhancement. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, very powerful practice. And then what you can do is you can, you can use that training to really strengthening the listening skill. So you, do, you, you practice circling with people. They start to pick up on this kind of, what is, it's interesting, Tim, what people report is they discover a kind of intimacy they didn't know about. It's not sexual intimacy. It's not friendship intimacy. But it's this other kind of intimacy. They say paradoxical things like this regularly. They, they say, this new kind of intimacy, but I've always been looking for it. Like they didn't know it, but they've always been looking for it. It's just really sounds like a psychedelic experience. <laughs> in some well, ways. I don't think that's actually off the mark. I've got a hypothesis. You're doing circling with multiple people and you're having mm -hmm. to do this multiple switching of perspectives and inhabiting and indwelling of other people and letting them indwell you. And it's getting areas of the brain to talk to each other that normally don't talk to each other. Very, very similar to a psychedelic experience. I'm not going to say when I have done psilocybin, <laughs> but there was phenomenological overlap from my experience of that and my experience in deep flow. Yeah. And then absolutely. you move people to paraphrasing. So they get the mm -hmm. circling ability, they, they're into that. And then what you do is I'll say something and you stop me after this. And you have to paraphrase back to me with using as few of my words as possible. Until oh, I agree that that's you, an interesting constraint. <laughs> yes. You can't just pair it back from memory, right? Yeah. You have to understand and convey. And the, and the person gives you feedback. No, you didn't get it. Yes, you did. And you practice doing that, right? What is the intent, the objective? The intent is to realize that one half of communication is listening. 
<laughs> Shocker. <laughs> Which yeah. is easy to say, but hard. So you slow down and you make mm-hmm. space and you let it impact you more deeply. Yeah, you really have to slow down to operate within that constraint, not using the same language. Exactly, exactly. Mm. And then you move into philosophical fellowship. It, it's, it's a thing I've derived from uh, Rand Lahav's philosophical contemplative companionship, or, or I forget what he calls it. He and I have emailed it. So what I'm doing is not the same, but it was inspired by. So it goes something like this. You pick a philosophical text and you prime people into this. We're not going to be reading this text in order to get information from it. We're going to be reading this text in order to be transformed by it. We're going to use this text as a way of trying to presence a sage. It's almost like a secular seance, right? You're going to, pre- <laughs> you're going to presence a sage so that, remember we talked about earlier, internalizing the sage. That yep. You really can't do that unless you know, the presence of the perspectival knowing of the sage is available to you. So what Mm -hmm. happens is, first of all, you read the text very slowly, and then the speaker will pick out a phrase that he or she thinks conveys Mm. it. And then everybody chants it, like in sequence, and they chant it, and they're trying to convey as much and also resonate with what they're sensing other people are conveying. So it's like jazz, and you do this. And then you move into simple speech. Everybody is allowed to say no more than three sentences about what is being provoked, invoked, and evoked in their interaction with the text. And they have to try it. And the task is, I want you to convey as much as you possibly can in as few words as possible. Hmm. And so everybody does this. But you can't just do it atomically. You have to pick up on what other people have said when you do your right simple speech. And you do that for several rounds and people, and what happens is people are also asked, try to sense how all of these different perspectives converge back to Spinoza or Plato or Bruber or whoever it is. And then you're doing that. And then you move into extended speech. Everybody's now allowed to give three or four sentences, a bit more, and open it up. And they can even relate it to some experience that they've had in their life. And you can see it's, and then you move into free speech where people just talk about it. And what happens is people get a sense of the text coming alive and Spinoza being present or Buber being present, obviously not literally, but in this sense of there's something about the intersection in the we space that gives them a sense of what, what was the mind that generated or is the origin of all of this. And you're, you're sort of, and you resonate with it and you pick it up and it gives you an opportunity to internalize the sage. 